So it looks like it's time to get started. So I'll introduce Tim while uh, people are still finding their seats. So I'm happy to, to say that Tim, our molecular pathology genetic fellow, is going molecular genetic pathology fellow is going to be presenting to us this morning. Tim came from us came to us from Cleveland Clinic, and uh, he did his uh, training in clinical genetics from Baylor. And today he's going to be talking to us about the link between hemihyperplasia and cancer. Thanks. So I'm sure everybody had an exciting uh, night last night watching all the drama. Hopefully this won't uh, stimulate quite as much. So today we're going to be talking about hemihyperplasia and cancer and how the syndromic association might be able to help us figure out a little bit about the basic etiology as well as help on the clinical side on how to treat these patients. Can everybody hear me if I talk like this? We're good volume. I'm not blasting you out. Sweet. All right. So I have no disclosures. Uh, the basic question that we start with is, is it normal to have body asymmetry? And as with most things in life, it's more complicated than yes or no. It really depends on how old you are. The older you get, the more likely it is that you have a mild asymmetry to your body. However, at birth, that's probably not so normal. So we all know this person. So which of these is the right picture? Our bodies are hardwired to be able to find symmetry in things. So even though this is asymmetrical for reasons that are debatable, you can see that that is the real picture. But if you go ahead and make it symmetric with either half of the face, it just innately looks wrong to us. And this is how clinicians are basically using their clinical judgment to figure out whether or not there's a problem they need to deal with. Now, not all types of asymmetry are bad. There's also acquired asymmetry, like if you're an arm wrestling champion. Uh, this is not congenital. You can get through usage an asymmetry that would also make a difference. So what sorts of asymmetry do we see in clinic that we're worried about? So the first case we have is a 15-month-old who was seen by their PCP for an annual exam. On physical exam, it was noted that one leg was bigger than the other. So that looks a little bit like this. As you can see, the uh, one leg has both a girth as well as a length issue. We have the classic, what I call the bent knee sign, which is your body's way of automatically compensating for that discrepancy. So these kids hardly ever will have that other leg fully extended. So when you're looking at somebody with this, the questions you need to ask are how many areas are affected, what tissues are affected, because that's going to change how scared you should be that you found this in your patient. So if it's bone, that's where the leg length discrepancy usually comes from. It's actually a difference in the length of the bone. If it's a vascular anomaly, you're worried about uh, venous drainage, you're worried about arterial malformations, abnormal capillaries, which could have a risk of bleeding or have other complications there. Or it could just be a total soft <coughs> tissue sort of issue. So on that patient we saw before, if you actually take a look at the back of her leg, now we've discovered that there's an abnormal capillary malformation here, and we're a little less worried about a cancer risk, a little bit more worried that we need a good, a good ultrasound of that leg and make certain there's not an underlying blood vessel abnormality in the big vessels that's going to cause a problem. So the other things is it might not be that subtle. This is not a subtle vascular anomaly. But what you will notice is the clear lines of demarcation that happen here and the fact that it's only on one side of the body and kind of follows a mosaic pattern. This suggests that there's somatic uh, mosaicism going on, but does not necessarily mean that when you get down into the molecular etiology. So here's a second case. Same age. A little bit different asymmetry at this point in that it's an upper body versus lower body asymmetry. Both, side, both legs have this very large appearance to them. This is Milroy disease, and this is all lymphedema. This is a congenital lymphedema syndrome that has no cancer risk, but does have significant morbidities from the lymph, lymph Stasis, I believe is the term I'm looking for, where it just doesn't move and it can cause problems. Uh, case three is somebody who's sent for facial asymmetry. Now, this is a little bit more subtle. And again, the younger they are, the more subtle they tend to be. 
what you can see here is just overall face and then way that the mouth is held and the fact that the nose deviates slightly. So based on just morphology, the right side is a little bit larger than the other side. And the tongue also is sticking out a little bit more, which this photo doesn't really capture. So this is back with Wiedemann syndrome. And even though this is only in the face, it's enough to make you worry that you need to do other testing because there's a very, well, relatively high risk of cancer developing in these patients that are fast growing and need to be treated. So with this in mind, which of them has the 10% tumor risk in life? It's this one. Even though they all have some sort of asymmetry going on, the other two have an almost 0% increased risk over the baseline population. So what is it about the growth that's happening in Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome that's different than the growth or the large size that's in the other two? That's what we're going to be talking about today. So in a non-syndromic population, your malignant cancer risk is about 1 in 7,000. So when you start taking a look at Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, a 10% increase risk still doesn't mean that you're going to have cancer, but it's definitely high enough that you should be considering screening. So today, hopefully, by the end of this talk, you'll be able to outline the different causes of hemihyperplasia, differentiate and act on cancer risk based on the primary etiology of the hemihyperplasia, and identify research needed for better diagnosis and surveillance. So let's go over overgrowth syndromes as a whole. You can kind of split them, if you're a splitter, into symmetric and asymmetric. Soto syndrome, Costello syndrome, simpson galabi bemmel Perlman, maternal UPD4, all sort of fall in this risk where it's going to be on both sides of the body. Asymmetric is going to be more like your Beckwith-Wiedemann, your Proteus, your P10, but even then you'll get into some debate because Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome has a macrosomia that develops in the prenatal area, and at birth they're very big, and then postnatally they're actually very big for their size and for expected parental heights as well. But they also have an asymmetry growth within that generalized overgrowth. So you could actually put it into both categories. So it's not a clean division, but at least gives you a general idea of the sorts of things that you're dealing with. So when you're looking at these overgrowth syndromes, one of the first questions is, well, is the asymmetric side too big or is it the other side too small? That's really a clinical judgment based upon different measurements you can do or what the other parts of the body look like, quite honestly. What's making it asymmetric? This gets to the underlying question of what tissue is affected. And then why don't all of them develop cancer if we have inherited forms of this asymmetry? And this is going to get into those uh, somatic mosaicism uh, pictures we were showing a little bit earlier. So let's ask the question, which of these feet is abnormal? There's clearly a difference. Anybody want to take a guess? left. We're going to say left is smaller. That's actually true in this case, but it could just as easily have gone the other way. When you cut off all the other features of the body, it's a little hard to say which one's the abnormal size. So this is actually somebody with a hemiatrophy as opposed to a hemihypertrophy or hemihyperplasia. So why do I say or hemihyperplasia? Because the nomenclature has changed over time. If you go back into the early literature, it really was about hemihypertrophy, which was thought to be increased size. But when you actually start going through and looking at this closer, there's actually extracellular proliferation, which is why they really tried to push this into using the hemihyperplasia nomenclature. Hemiatrophy can be from a couple of different things. You could have just a complete structural atrophy, like here. So this is Poland anomaly or Poland syndrome, where you get an abnormal development congenitally of the pectoral muscle. So you can see the asymmetry here and here. That's been there since birth. The reason these two are flexing for us is because there's a uh, large uh, bodybuilding sort of compensation support group that's happened for the males that have this to, to I don't, com com build camaraderie, other sorts of things. So there's a whole group of people with pollen anomaly that get together and lift weights. But this is not necessarily a genetic syndrome. It's considered more a lack of a blood vessel supply to the affected area, which leads to lack of nutrients and atrophy. So we don't know the genetic mechanism of it. It's a relatively common phenomenon, but it doesn't have an increased cancer risk, and it really does affect uh, 
the overall structure from the embryological period. That's a little bit different than if you were going to say that that left leg was at atrophic because then it's more a question of there's a somatic change that's happening within that tissue that's leading to the asymmetry. So why is it only on one side of the body? So this again gets back to the idea of somatic mosaicism. Here you can see depending on what say, stage you have the change happening during embryogenesis, you can have it develop on just one side of the body, it can be patched across, or it can be in a very small area. For the ones that we're talking about, obviously, it's mainly this sort of category or this sort of category, suggesting, again, that even though there might be inherited underlying genetic defects, the manifestations of those defects can happen in a segmental pattern or they can be happening because of a post-zygotic somatic change. So if we go back to some of these generalized overgrowth syndromes or the localized overgrowth syndromes, you can come up with a frequency of malignancy uh, based uh, on empiric studies and also a ratio of increased risk over the general population. beckwith wiedemann as you can see, is there, and it has about an 8% risk if you average it out over all of the studies. Isolated hemihyperplasia, which is essentially one or two parts of the body being asymmetric from the others, but without any of the other features of these inherited syndromic disorders or even somatic disorders, is something that is a diagnosis of exclusion. The reason we bring it up is that it also has an increased cancer risk. Now, things like Klippel Trinani, which is that vascular malformation we saw earlier, they don't have an increased cancer risk, even though there is overgrowth of the vasculature. Again, this probably has to do with the underlying um, genes that are uh, at play, as well as whether or not you can get a cancer type phenotype if those genes are overexpressed. So isolated hemihypertrophy is where we're going to start. And the reason that I'm highlighting Beckwith and isolated hyperplasia is that they're not uncommon diagnoses that we see in the pediatrics genetics clinic. They have an increased cancer risk, and there are specific tumor surveillance protocols that exist to try to keep these patients safe. Isolated hemihypertrophy is about 1 in 86,000 live births. It has specific American College of Medical Genetics diagnostic criteria, which are very practical. These are not subtle differences you're diagnosing in these kids. They are differences you should see from the foot of the exam bed. So if you're saying, mm, I don't know if that crease is slightly bigger or not, then that's probably an overcall on your part as a clinician. You don't want to put them on the tumor surveillance protocol. It is a diagnosis of exclusion, so you have to do the due diligence to make sure there aren't signs of beckwith wiedemann that there's no vascular anomalies, that there's not a bony anomaly that's causing it. There's not something else that could be at play here because we don't have a genetic test for it. We don't really know what causes isolated hemihyperplasia. Only 20% of isolated hemihyperplasia will have positive syndromic testing. So what does that mean? That means you've done the full exam, you've gone ahead and you've done most of the genetic testing that you think is appropriate for the clinical phenotype. And of those, you'll find that 20% of them will test positive for something that you were only doing because it was part of the protocol, not because you thought it was real. So this can lead to a couple of different conclusions. One would be that it represents the mild end of something like the Beckwith-Wiedemann spectrum. It's isolated to one area. They don't have the other clinical phenotypes for it, but the same somatic molecular changes are at play. Whether our techniques are good enough to detect them or not is debatable, but that's the underlying mechanism tool. The other would be that those are not isolated hemihyperplasia. By definition, as you were doing your exclusionary process, you found a different answer for them, so there is still a different clinical outcome and clinical phenotype between those and the ones that are still molecularly negative. The data is still out on whether or not uh, which of those hypotheses is correct, and that's something where there needs to be more research on because all these patients that are coming in get put on a tumor surveillance protocol if you can't rule in or out something else that is not um, an, a minor burden on the families or on the healthcare system. So clinically, what does this look like? Well, the morbidity is dependent on the site. If you have facial hemihypertrophy or hemihyperplasia, basically you're talking about dentition, you're talking about the ability to chew, you're talking about plastic surgery to the face to make them not look as abnormal if necessary, depending on the degree. 
The leg length discrepancy tends to be a very practical concern as well. Not in terms of the girth, though that can be dramatic, but just in the idea of you can have anywhere from a two to a two, two centimeter to a two inch discrepancy. There are surgical interventions that you can do, and then there are non-surgical interventions you can do. The cutoff's about two centimeters. So if you get created a leg length discrepancy of about two centimeters, then you're gonna start doing heel lifts, like this shoe down here. Now most of our orthotics or orthopedics departments have a deal with either New Balance or somebody else to create shoes like this to help that are at minimal cost to the patients. Because what's the problem with creating a one-year-old or a two-year-old that's gonna to have to go through multiple sets of shoes with different sizes for each feet? It's a large cost to the family as that kid grows up. So these deals are essential to make the life of quality life better for the patient. Other concern would be then if it goes beyond about five centimeters, then you're going to have to ask yourself, do we need to do something surgically about it? So a couple of things you can do, you can go into the growth, growth plate of the bigger leg and disrupt it. That'll stop it from growing anymore. The downside of that is they're going to be much shorter than they should have been probably. The other way that you could do it is you could go in, you could surgically break the leg, move the parts of the bone apart and let it grow across to lengthen it. They both sound a little barbaric, but if it's bad enough that you've created that much of a gap, like you're seeing with this patient, it probably should be done a little bit earlier before the growth uh, phase of the bones have stopped. So long-term concerns with this are not just the practical concerns, they're the cancer concerns. Mainly it's Wilms tumor. There are reports of hepatoblastoma and other abdominal cancers at a lower, uh, lower incidence. Based on a meta-analysis and some good studies in the early 2000s, U.S. recommendations came out in 2009 that these patients receive an abdominal ultrasound every three months until seven years of age. They should get a serum alpha feta protein measured every three months until four years of age. And this is to look for the fast-growing tumors because three months lets you catch it early enough that it changes the surgical interventions that you can do for them and helps the overall survival and morbidity on the far side of the treatments. Uh, the other thing that's somewhat debatable is the alpha fetal protein. Why is it debatable? Because in kids under the two, two years of age, the reference ranges are difficult. Prematurity factors in uh, any sort of organomegaly like you get with Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome factors in and creates these different ranges that have made it hard to know whether or not somebody's really in an abnormal range or not. So there's a split here between the US and Europe. Europe really doesn't recommend following the AFP levels in these kids. They think that it's a waste of time and resources. Here in the US, it's part of the guidelines that we routinely do. So until about four to eight years of age, you're having these patients and the, their kids come in every three months to get an ultrasound and to have a blood draw. Uh, it's not the worst surveillance protocol in the world, but it's certainly not an easy one for the families either. So is isolated hemihypertrophy a mild form of Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome? Well, when you take a look at the different cancers that we were talking about, they mimic the Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome cancers fairly closely, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But because of that incidence, which tends to be around 5%, that's enough that the recommendations came out that they should go on the same surveillance protocol as the Beckwith-Wiedemann patients. So when you're looking at isolated hemihypertrophy, the data saying that it's a mild form is very dubious at best. What they did was they did a couple of case reports where they found the same molecular changes as in the Beckwith-Wiedemann diagnoses and said, oh, that must mean it's part of it. But they can't explain why we're not seeing it in the vast majority of people that have isolated hemihyperplasia. So whether it's a technique sensitivity issue, whether it's a basic difference in the underlying etiology, we still don't know. So Beckwith-Wiedemann itself is not isolated hemihypertrophy. There are many other things that go along with it. They get these very characteristic ear creases. They obviously have big tongues. The tongues themselves can have hemihyperplasia as well. You'll have these kids come in and what, their tongue is always deviated because one side is way bigger than the other. The important thing to keep in mind about this relatively large tongue is that it can inf interfere with feeding, it can interfere with breathing, and what you really hope that you don't have to do is tongue planing or resection. 
because eventually the kids will grow into the tongue enough that the mouth can close around it and it doesn't cause those issues. Whereas there's some morbidity and sequelae from doing the tongue reduction surgery. But if the kid can't breathe and the kid can't eat, sometimes you're stuck. The other sorts of things you can see with Beck with Wiedemann, they get this a sort of nevius flamius here, and they also uh, characteristically have an emphalocele, which is uh, sort of pathognomonic in the pediatrics world. If somebody says emphalocele, you get this knee-jerk response of, oh, is it Beck with Wiedemann? So those are the sorts of things that come together. That being said, the most sensitive marker is actually the macroglossia in a lot of the studies that have been out there. So... When you start taking a look at these different areas, what you see is a generalized picture of big kids with multiple structural defects that may or may not have hemihypertrophy. So do all cases of Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome have the same cancer risk? And the answer to that is, well, we're currently treating them as if they do, even though the underlying genetic etiology now is known to be very different. So the diagnostic criteria for these are recently revised. You need three major findings, two major and one minor, or any sort of finding plus a molecular diagnosis. So you can mix and match to a certain extent. Your most sensitive, like I talked about, is the macroglossia. However, the one that has the most significant morbidity associated with cancers is actually the hemihyperplasia. So if you see the hemihyperplasia, you are much more likely to have an increased risk of tumor, regardless of what the underlying genetic defect is. So it's not just malignant tumors either. There's a significant number of benign tumors that occur. And most of these, as you can see, the number of cases is relatively low, but you're getting lots of one-offs. And it's hard to make screening guidelines when it can be so varied. So in terms of the benign ones, you deal with them as they come, but you're going to see sort of a recurring motif in the way these are set up in that we see a lot of rare tumors that you can't really set up a screening protocol for for the malignant ones as well. So the cancer risk across all tumor types is about 8%. Most are embryonic in origin. Most are Wilms tumors. And the ones that aren't Wilms tumors, most of them are in the abdomen as well. So again, this is where that recommendation for the abdominal ultrasounds is going to come from because it's going to hit most of your areas where those tumors are going to form. The types of cancer tend to be pediatric cancers. So overall, the risk returns much closer to the underlying patient population risk the closer you get to 10 years of age, which is why a lot of these tumor surveillance protocols stop around 6, 8, 10 years of age. Now, why is that? Well, there's a couple of different things that you can think about. One is Wilms tumor is the most common. The suspected etiology of the way that Wilms tumor works is that you have these rafts left over in the kidney from embryogenesis, and those are the ones that then develop into the Wilms tumor. Based on that idea that they're left over, if they're going to develop a Wilms tumor, it's going to happen in the relatively short period of time where that leftover tissue is still functioning. So that's why they tend to occur, and then it dies off as you get over, because if they were there, they probably already generated the tumor. Is there a lot of data for that? Well, there's a lot of data that the rafts are there. There's a lot of data that the rafts turn into Wilms tumor. Is that the explanation why they don't occur later? There's not as much data there on that. So it's a little bit harder to tease that out. The hepatoblastoma and the adrenal adenoma or carcinoma, those are the ones that are also high. Those are ones that you could also consider screening for. But when you start getting into these lower ones, the prevailing theory has been the incidence isn't high enough to justify the cost of the screening. Now, this is all based off those original reports from 2000 to 2009. Molecular techniques and diagnosis have gotten much better since then. So the question in the field became, can we now substratify based off genetic etiology? So let's talk about the genetics of Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome. So essentially what you have is about three or four different mechanisms of disruption that can lead to the Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome phenotype. This is more of an overall uh, top-down approach to what's happening. In the normal population, you have the paternally inherited side having methylation, which causes IGF-2 to be expressed, which is positive for cell growth. And on the female side, you have a balance. You have H19, which is inhibitory on cell growth. And this leads to the normal sort of patterning that you would expect. 
in something such as Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, what you're getting is unrestrained signaling from IGF-2, which is leading that cell growth. So now let's go dive a little bit deeper now, now that we have an idea of what the overall effect of the genetic pathway is. You have a centromeric domain and a telomeric domain. You have a CDKN1C, you have KCNQ1, H19. And then embedded within this gene, you have something that was previously referred to as the LIT1 gene, which is now called this much longer name. And then you have IGF2 down here. So when you have appropriate methylation, what you can see is on the maternal side, you get expression of CDKN1C, KCNQ1, and H19, but not the IGF2. This is very similar to sort of the Angelman prader willi uh, scenario where you get differential methylations at these imprinted regions that cause differential expression from the parent of inheritance. The difference here is that you have two different imprinting control regions called ICR2 and ICR1. And we've also found that mutations within CDKN1C can cause your phenotype as well. And if you disrupt both of these, you get Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome 2. We'll come back to that last one a little bit later. If you disrupt both of the imprinting centers, you have a Beckwith-Wienemann phenotype, but there might be other things going on as well. So how does this then work for growth? So in your proper, proper somatic input, again, you have IGF-2 down here, H19 up here. You get a balance of the uh, pro-growth and inhibitory growth factors. When you start perturbing that imprinting, you're either going to get one uh, or the other that's more strongly expressed, leading to your different phenotypes. And this, much like the, the prader willi angelman story, is sort of flip sides of the same code, uh, <laughs> the same coin, excuse me. When you're talking about Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, you think big. They're big babies. They have overgrowth. They have tumors that grow. What happens if you don't have that input? You get small babies that are failure to thrive that have hemiatrophy. That's called silver russer syndrome, and it's caused by the same sort of imprinting defects, just in the opposite way. So it presents a very nice dichotomy of growth and growth factors on a syndromic scale in patients that you can use to probe the underlying growth factor etiology and ramifications. So IGF-2 is one of the major drivers here. IGF-2 has signaling through IGF-1 receptor and the IGF-2 receptor. Interestingly, the IGF-2 receptor doesn't have a tyrosine kinase domain. So the current theory of mechanism is that it exists to sop up the growth factor signaling so that you don't get too much running through the system. Sure. There's not a lot of data for that. It seems odd that we would have a something there that only exists to bind things, but there is precedent in the body, so maybe it's not that abnormal. If you actually get signaling through the IGF-1R receptor, you can see that we're stimulating the AKT pathway, the cyclin pathway, the mTOR pathway, and this leads to the proliferation that we're describing before. So keep in mind that there are other genetic overgrowth syndromes that stimulate different areas of this pathway. PIK3C, uh, which a lot of us know from the cancer world, also causes things like Clove syndrome, where you get these uncontrolled lipomas that grow in the patients with asymmetry. So again, this pathway is definitely involved in symmetrical or asymmetrical abnormal growth. Depending on which level you're at, you'll get different syndromes. CDKN1C is the other gene that seems to be at play here, and it's, its other uh, protein product name is P57KIP2. The idea behind this one is that it actually either blocks or suspends progression from G1 through the S phase. There's more recent data that suggests that it happens here, and then you look at another paper and they say, no, the block is over here. There's some conflicting data as to where the actual block is, but in terms of its absolute effect, it stops the cell cycle from continuing to go through the different phases. So when we go back to the genetics of, of Silver-Russell syndrome, again, you can see the idea here that depending on which side of that coin you're overexpressing or underexpressing, you can have cell overgrowth or lack of cell growth, and that leads to the different phenotypes.
So the proposed diagnostic testing with these mechanisms in mind is that you start out with the methylation testing. And you also can look for microsatellites for uniparental diazomy, which leads to imprinting defects because both parts of it are inherited from the same parent. Based on those results, you either sort of have your answer and you need to do a little bit more to figure out what the mechanism of the imprinting defect is. Or if it's borderline, you're worried about mosaicism and you need to look in another tissue. If it's negative, then theoretically you could go to the CDKN1C sequencing. The wonderful thing about these schemes is that they make sense. You're like, oh, we do one first, and then we go to the next, and we can play the percentages. The bad thing about it is that you have a patient, meanwhile, that you're worried about, that the parents are freaking out about, that they want the testing back now. So a lot of times these are ordered as automatic reflex panels, where you don't even have to get the results of the first one before the lab has gone on to the next one if the first one was negative. So that makes the process much faster and more efficient to get the answers back for the families. So your clinical diagnosis versus your molecular diagnosis. So again, there's that clinical criteria you can use, plus or minus the molecular. Clinically, there are about 10 to 20 percent of cases of Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome where you're just going down the checklist and you're like, yeah, they have Beckwith-Wiedemann, but you can't find the molecular etiology for it. This could play a role in the isolated hemihypertrophy as well. Again, is it a sensitivity issue with somatic mutations and methylation, or is there another gene still in the pathway that we haven't discovered that's representing those other 10 to 20 percent? We don't know yet. There's more research going on in that area. Within the ones that have a molecular diagnosis, 70 percent of them hit the uh, imprinting uh, control region 2. 20% have a uniparental disomy of the chromosome that it's on, which is 11, and 5 to 10% of them will have hypermethylation of ICR1. Again, looking at that seesaw and figuring out which way you're tipping the seesaw. So your diagnostic sample matters whenever you're talking about somatic mutations. Tongue tissue is an affected area. You're always better off testing the affected tissue. So if you have a tongue that is this big, you cannot feed and eat around it. So this is the actual surgery that you do, and now you theoretically have tongue tissue that you could test. We usually start with blood, but again, blood is not one of the cell lines that's usually affected. So if you get your answer, it's great. You got lucky, there was enough mosaicism there that you found your answer. But by the same token, if it's negative, you haven't really ruled it out because you haven't uh, tested one of the more affected cell lineages. When you actually go in and take a look at differences between, for example, blood and tongue, and in this case we're looking for signs of uniparental diazomy, what you're seeing here are the arrows where this population is below the arrow, this population is at the arrow. These are the sort of subtle findings that these arrays can give you that let you know that the amount of mosaic UPD that's present in the tongue versus the blood is different. And that difference is probably what leads to the uncontrolled growth in different parts of the body. There's a somatic methylation change rather than a somatic mutation that's causing these differences, so to speak. So silver russell, again, if you have it tipped the other way, instead of having too large a tongue, you have too small a tongue. These are kids that have notorious failure to thrive and they will get put on these very high caloric diets to push them to gain the weight and the growth that they need. They can be on 30 kcal, 32 kcal per ounce formulas, and they're just not gonna grow. You can feed them as much as you want, they're not gonna grow. So again, the diagnosis actually helps change clinical management, even though it's not a treatment per se, because you know that the defect of the growth is there. So, the surveillance recommended from these 05 to 09 papers is an abdominal ultrasound every three months until eight years of age. AFP levels every two to three months until four years of age. Again, with the idea being that around these ages are when the incidence of uh, the tumor starts to decline and get closer to that of the general population, so it is not as important to look for them anymore. At around eight years old till mid-adolescence, they recommend annual renal ultrasound. I love this because I'm still not quite sure, even though I've been doing this for about 10 years now, what mid-adolescence actually means when you talk to a family about it. Uh, consideration of annual or biannual uh, urinary calcium creatinine ratios looking for signs of kidney dysfunction that might not be a tumor per se, but is known to have effects that need to be treated by a nephrologist. 
these are the same surveillance guidelines are very similar to those proposed for IHH. Whether that's right or not is debatable. This does not include adrenocortical tumor surveillance uh, or neuroblastoma surveillance. The idea there was even though they know it occurs, the thought was it's at such a low incidence, it's not worth screening for, and they should have clinical signs that you don't miss the diagnosis for. So can we make this better? There's a lot of research that's gone on in the last five years or so trying to streamline this process and make it easier for the families. We try to enroll in one of these studies, we try to recruit patients, and what we found is the incidence is so low at any one center that you're just not going to get a big enough sample size that you can do it. So you really need to have patient registries and other things where you can get them together. So, if you had one of those, you could say, why don't we actually look at the tumors that have developed? Let's do molecular profiling on the tumor, see if we can work backwards. Why did this tumor develop? Is it, did it develop in a way that we can look for it in the patient's cells as part of their initial screening so we know whether they're at risk later? It's a great idea, but there's no tumor tissue repository out there for these. So essentially what you have to have is you have to have enough of the tumor incidence of each type of tumor within your own place or a big multi-center study that's going to pool them that you could do it, and that just hasn't happened. So there are a few case reports of isolated tumors having molecular screening done on them, whether it's staining, whether it's expression profiling, whether it's mutation screening. But again, there are so few and so far between that you can't make any sort of recommendations out of them or get a lot of data from them. Uh, there is no tissue in hand case series like I was talking about. Like if we had 30 people with beckwith Wiedemann syndrome walk through the door with Wilms tumor, yeah, we could do this study and that would be fantastic. But that just is not in the literature because nobody has developed those resources yet. So we can't really test hypothesis one because we don't have the tools for it. So hypothesis two. Factors affecting cancer prognosis would be best identified looking at the cell type that causes the initial hyperplasia. So rather than looking at blood, why aren't we doing skin fibroblasts? Why aren't we looking at the tongue tissue? Why aren't we looking at these other things to try to decide what's going on? And the short answer is you could do that. You could compare affected and unaffected sides. But what's the tissue that you're going to use? Are you going to use skin? Are you going to use muscle? Are you going to use fat? None of those really have been looked at in a complete or concise way to know what the right type is. There are the tongue resuctions, and there are some studies that have looked at that. And the really hard part here is that you're doing a skin biopsy or a muscle biopsy. The beckwith Wiedemann kids and their families will buy into that because there's enough going on that they're worried and they're willing to help move the field forward. The isolated hemihyperplasia kids, their families don't want the biopsy being done. We've tried to enroll them and my buy-in has been less than 5% because they just don't want their kids to go through the biopsies. So the next question, assuming you've got the tissue, would be what markers are you going to use? So epigenetic or genetic evaluation. You could use tumor profile markers because we do that on the oncology side quite a bit. Which ones you would include on the panel, it's a little debatable on because, again, Wilms tumor in the cosmic database of somatic mutations does have an awful lot of beta catenin changes, and there is some interplay between those two pathways. So you, maybe you could look for those sort of somatic changes. But has any of that been done in a sample set that's unique to beckwith Wiedemann versus unique to all the other Wilms tumors that exist out there? And the answer is, is no, we, we don't have that data. That would be useful data to get, assuming you have the tissues for it. Uh, maybe we could switch to animal models to answer this question. So one of the things you could think of doing is, can we make a mouse model that recapitulates it, recapitulates the hemihypertrophy, or at least gets us access to the different tissues? So that's been tried in a couple of different ways. But first, we're going to talk about the comparison tongue data that I talked about. So here you have the methylation analysis in the blood, and here you have the methylation analysis in the tongue. And what you can see is that compared between the two, the tongue was more sensitive for small or slight changes in the methylation pattern than it was in the blood. That's what that you know blood versus tissue uh, here is talking about. Similarly, when there was normal findings in the blood, they did find some 
abnormal findings in the tongue. This again suggests that in terms of diagnostic quality, if you get a negative in the blood, it hasn't ruled out that that's still the actual diagnosis. Does it help actually explain why the tumors have developed or not? It explains why the hemihyperplasia is there in the tongue, I think. It's those changes in the somatic methylation levels really are driving the hyperplasia in the affected tissue. But this is an end of one tissue. To really say that that's what's going on, you would probably need to check hemihyperplasia in other parts of the body in these same patients and see if it correlates. And that study wasn't done. The other thing that I will say here, why is tongue in quotes? Well, not all of these kids actually had a tongue resection. About half of them, they took a buckle swab, rammed it across the tongue a few times, and called that a tongue specimen. <laughs> so we have to be a little careful in what we're actually comparing here. So the mouse models, the trouble is the imprinting centers are not the same. They're there, but when you manipulate them by hypo or hypermethylation or mutation, they don't cause the same phenotype in the same way and the same genes are not expressed. So it's an imperfect system to evaluate the most common cause of Beckwith-Wiedemann, which is the abnormalities in the methylation pattern. However, they've even tried to take the human methylation centers pull out the mouse ones and stick the human ones in, and it still doesn't recapitulate the phenotype in the way that we would want or the expression profile. So this very well at the moment seems like a dead end in that we can't use the mouse model to get where we need to go. The model does show structural defects. If you go through and create mutations in the CDKN1C genes or the IGF2 mutation. If you start manipulating the specific genes themselves rather than the methylation centers, you can get the structural defects. For example, the omphalocele abdominal hernia defects you are very common, but you don't get the hemihypertrophy, hemihyperplasia. You don't get the asymmetry. You don't get the actual macrosomia phenotype either. So the system is different enough in mice that you can't use it. But cows might be the answer. So there were a number of studies uh, at the uh, last three to four years where they went into the bovine models and said, look, the methylation loci are the same. Look, the expression profile is the same. Look, they create what's called large offspring syndrome. What's great about large offspring syndrome? Well, the farmers want it because it actually helps the amount of product that they can sell. Is it great product? I don't know. I, but by the same token, this is a very real phenomenon, and it's something that they have a vested interest in figuring out. And if it actually does recapitulate the human system, maybe that's not a bad model to use. Uh, a lot of these studies were done in Delaware, uh, but they're out there and they could be used if we could pursue that route. It's not clear whether or not the hemihypertrophy exists in the large offspring. I couldn't find any reports of it, but I have not examined the cows myself, so I, I can't really say. So it, maybe the animal models aren't going to get us where we need to go. Maybe we're not getting enough buy-in from the patients to do the sampling we want. So how about a third hypothesis? How about we actually look at the genotype, the etiology of the Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome and see if we can make the tumor surveillance protocol easier depending on what actual cause it is. You could also theoretically apply this same strategy to the uh, IHH patients that we're talking about because you're saying that they're part of the same spectrum anyway. The bad part about that is that I don't really have a molecular diagnosis to stratify them on, so you'd probably still have to lump them in into the, the most serious screening protocol that you come up with for the Beckwith-Wiedemann kids. Here you're going to run into a problem with uh, adequate sample size. So based on your incidences, you really need a registry. One of these does exist at CHOP, where they're going through and trying to get all the information from these patients. Or you could have a nationalized healthcare system where everybody gets tested at the same central institution and all of the patients are evaluated by the same doctors. Well, that's not going to happen here. Uh, but it does happen in France and in Italy, and we have the data from those studies that we can use. So in 2012 through 2014, there were three papers on small cohorts that basically corroborated the earlier meta-analysis that the initial screening protocols were based on. 
Uh, however, they did see distinct differences on the molecular etiology when they had enough numbers for the substratification. The trouble is, is when you have a small sample size, you can't generate enough power to actually make clinical consensus recommendations off of it. So this really was looking for one of two things to happen. We need a lot more really small studies so that we can do a meta-analysis lumping them all together, or you need a large, you know, more um, cohesive study that can sort of be lumped in and create a meta-analysis out of that. So that's what the French consortium did and what the Italian consortium did. And then after the Italian consortium uh, sort of had their findings, they created consensus guidelines for use within Italy. The French data, the Italian data, are very similar in what they found. Their recommendations are not the same. It just goes to show that even if you have good data, what clinical preferences you use is still going to vary. So just to sort of remind you here, we're going to be talking about ICR2 and ICR1. So I wanted to refresh you where those are because all the tables and data I'm going to show you refers to it as those different areas. So what you can see here in the data from France is they had 407 patients with Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome. Of those, 35 of them had tumors, which gets us around to that 8 to 10 percent tumor incidence that was seen in the previous studies. You can then go through and see each of the different molecular mechanisms that is causing the underlying uh, Beckwith-Wiedemann. It should be noted that molecular undiagnosable Beckwith, so clinically diagnosed Beckwith without the molecular cause, are excluded from this study. So that may or may not bias the results. Uh, what you can see is that the incidence for the ICR2 region is much lower than the others. This was also seen in the previous uh, reports from 2005 and 2009, but it was felt at that time that they couldn't risk missing something, so it was worth putting everybody on the screening protocol. Now that we have a lot more patients and the numbers are still bearing out, it really does call into question whether or not we should be screening patients with that genetic etiology. Overall, the types of tumors that they started to see in the different areas, Wilms tumor, again, tends to be the one that's most commonly seen, but it's not seen in the ICR2 locus, which has a low cancer incidence. Similarly, hepatoblastoma is seen across multiples. Neuroblastoma is seen across multiples, but it's a little bit lower, and because of that, they're suggesting it's not worth screening for because it's just not worth the hassle. What's the hassle? Well, it's a urine screen. And these are one- and two-year-olds, and three- and four-year-olds. Try getting a urine specimen that's clean from that patient population, and you'll find that working with toddlers is not fun. And so there's a significant hassle to the doctors and the families trying to get that specimen, and if the low is really yield, low, if the yield is low, is it worth it? So they, based off of this data, came up with their screening protocol. They said for the ICR2, which had that 2% cancer incident risk, do an initial evaluation, and then don't screen them anymore except clinically. It's not worth the hassle. The incidence is too low. It's not worth it. For intermediate risk, which were from the CDKN1C mutations, they probably shouldn't be screened as often. Their tumor types are slightly different. But because there's enough overlap, they would put them into something that looks very similar to the original screening protocols. So the screening protocols are the same, essentially, as what is done in the U.S. now. So for these higher-risk ones, it has not changed much in their studies, but what their big change is is they're saying, don't bother looking at these. This is from the Italian group, who has a few more patients. So we're talking about 836. They still only had about 21 patients with tumor. When they actually talk about the number of tumors, it is important to note that these patients can get multiple tumors in the same patient in different locations. So that can skew the data, so they tried to parse that out a little bit for us. There's a lot of data here. I don't expect you to be able to look at it all, so we're just going to highlight some, some areas here. In the ICR2 locus, again, they find very similarly 2.5% across all studies as part of a meta-analysis that includes the French group in terms of that frequency. The neuroblastic and rhabdomyosarcomas, they're rare, but they're occurring in this low cancer risk group, and they aren't as common across the others. So there must be something else there that's triggering a predisposition to that, but the numbers are still not high enough to justify the screening according to what they're talking about. 
Another point to keep in mind here is that for the Wilms tumor, it's very low in the CDKA1C and in the ICR2, but very high in the other two mechanisms. So that's the primary cancer incidence that's pushing those with, uh, again, a small subset of UPD having the adrenal and the neuroblastics as well. The CDKN1Cs is uh, neuroblastic, so again, there are these low levels of similar tissues percolating through. They're still relatively low, but now you've seen this data all the way from 2000 up through 2016 that they're there and they're real, which led the, Fr the French group to sort of say, maybe we need to do something about that. So this is, I'm sorry, that led the Italian group to say we need to do something about that. So this is sort of how they started weighting each of their different studies in the meta-analysis. And what they're saying is we're comparing them to this low-risk cancer group. So they're not even comparing them and their odds ratios to the general population. They're comparing them to the lowest risk group. And you can still see that for um, uh, the types of cancers across all comers, it's a tenfold increase over that lowest cause of beckwith wiedemann in many of the different things that you're looking at, regardless of which of the other three types of etiology you're speaking of. For Wilms tumor in particular, they went through and compared it to the centromeric defects and then also used the two different loci. Well, Wilms tumor seems to be one of the biggest prevailers. And you can see that there's a huge skewing, again, of risk, suggesting that those are the ones you need to watch out for in these patients as the most common causes. And that's what's gonna drive your screening protocols. They also went through and did it for hepatoblastoma, adrenal carcinoma, neuroblastoma. You can see that they still are skewing to almost 10 times the risk, but again, the incidence is small enough in them that it's debatable whether you wanna do the surveillance. So based on all of that data, they released the meta-analysis guidelines. The differences here are really down in this area. Similar to the French group, they say that for this uh, ICR2 methylation change, there should be just a clinic exam. You don't need to do the surveillance. But they actually say for UPD and this CDKN1C that those numbers of about 4% are starting to get high enough that they would recommend the uh, AFP levels they would recommend doing the DHEAS and the urinary screens. So similar data, different conclusions with different protocols. What I found really fascinating is that this meta-analysis, the exact same people that did this meta-analysis, then went through and published consensus guidelines that do not include this bottom half here. The consensus guidelines are the same as for the French group, which are the same as for the US group, except for the clinical exam up here, which it's debatable whether or not that you need to not screen those people. So after all this data came out, there was a North American response from Dr. Beckwith and a group in Toronto, at Toronto Sick Kids, who basically said, based on our experience, we don't think any of that's right. We're gonna keep doing what we're doing. <laughs> so from that point of view, the US recommendations haven't changed, even though there's a decent amount of data out there that suggests we could be taking a, a number of these kids off of this surveillance protocol with relative safety. So when you have controversy like this, there need to be some sort of consensus guidelines out there. And again, I think that there is research opportunities here that need to be investigated. Tissue repositories, better animal models. Those are the sorts of things that are really going to nail down what the sequelae are in the cells that will help us better develop these guidelines and possibly better screen our patients to see who needs to go on them. So hopefully over this course of the talk, you can tell me what the different causes of hemihyperplasia are. There is not a quiz. Uh, you can differentiate and act on the cancer risk based on the surveillance guidelines, and you can see where we need to actually be doing more research to make this relevant. And with that, I'd like to thank all the great Hemi families, as they call themselves, that have helped me with this throughout the years. Um, the Cleveland Clinic team where I did uh, the initial trials. Again, Dr. Yohi and the team here who have helped put this talk together. And with that, we'll take questions. It was a late night, so only easy questions. <laughs> I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Placental yeah. mesenchymal dysplasia, use that? That's a great question. The answer is, is yes, it's been studied. Actually, in the mouse models, they've actually found that the reason that the growth uh, doesn't 
happen abnormally is that you'll get a period where you'll actually get the macrosomia, but then the placental changes actually cause the fetus to return to normal sizes in the mice. So there is some data there suggesting that the, it's a placental change that's causing the differences in the mouse model that make it different than the human models. So do you think they could use that as a substitute tissue to test these patients rather than the tongue? Or that's a good question. When you actually start going into the um, placental tissue from the humans, they've done a little bit of preliminary work, sort of figuring out whether or not the defects they're seeing later on are there. And the answer is there are in some of them, but not all of them. So you could use it to a certain extent, and that would be a tissue that's, that's readily available, especially since with Beckwith-Wiedemann, we make a decent amount of the diagnosis prenatally because you can see that tongue sticking out even in the uh, 3D ultrasound pictures. The part of the problem that you're going to have a little bit is that there's a big debate in the field about assistive reproductive technology, and whether or not the methylation changes that are caused by art actually will change your placental patterning as well. Uh, so it's a, it's a good idea. You'd have to do approach it cautiously, though, I think. Good question. Betsy? So a while ago, I think there was a connection between Beckwith and having assisted reproductive techniques with IVF, basically on the timing of the implantation. Mm -hmm. So do they ever see one isolated hemihypertrophy within those cases where it has been linked to IVF? And then also, is it known in those cases that the mutations within, let's say, the wilms or whatever are the same? Or could that identify other regions of methylation that might be um, causing to your first question, which uh, the answer is yes, to a certain extent. The, um, let's answer the second question first, actually. So the actual molecular profiling in the tumors has not really been done in the WILMS because they basically have grouped all of them together as part of the big WILMS results. They haven't substratified out the Beckwith-Wiedemanns or the isolated hemihypertrophies to see if there's something different in there. That's a great idea. It, we just don't have the, the repository for it. Remind me of the, the, the specifics of your first question again. Yes, the, the answer is, is yes, they do. They also see Russell Silver syndrome. So, but the frequency of it is very, very low, and that's a very controversial field. Again, there were questions about timing of implants. There were actually some, um, the methylation donors and the culture media for the embryos was actually found to be a big risk factor. So they've now corrected for that, and there's some debate about whether or not that risk for the methylation defects still exists or not. So it's a little bit of a controversial area. There was another question? No? Yeah, I had a question. Do, we, um, do the cows get um, Wilms tumors or rhino tumors? The, the interesting thing about cows is that most of the time the, they're not checking for them. So in, like in terms of a, the, the, uh, the large offspring syndrome, it's not one of the things that they're looking at very often because they go to slaughter relatively early. But again, if you were thinking of the Wilms, that should happen a little bit earlier. I didn't see a lot of reports of it, so I don't know whether or not the cancer risk is there or not. Certainly it recapitulates the growth in the way that we want. But whether or not you're getting the asymmetry, whether or not you have the cancer risk, I think that needs to be fleshed out a little bit more. And, and I'll be honest, I'm not the bovine expert, so it might be there and I might have missed it, but there were only about three or four papers on it that I could find that discussed it. I guess my question, too, is obviously there's a lot of complex molecular mechanisms going on in these spectrums. With the differential tumor incidences given the individual genes that are altered or methylated, has anyone looked, instead of just correlating those with those genes directly, like all of the data from the registries, for either secondary abnormalities or even like GWAT SNPs and either other components of the methylation machinery, other components in DNA repair, albeit most of the rhyolin tumors actually have very low levels of mutations compared to you know adult solid tumors. But things like that that are maybe outside of the genes that are causative of the syndrome, but the people that get tumors and the rates at which they get them may actually just be related to other 
That's probably, that's my hypothesis as to what's going on. Whether it's been looked at or not, there are these entities out there that are called multiple loci imprinting disorders, or MLIDs. I didn't have time to include them in the talk, but these are the ones where, remember how I said we get back to possibly that if you have both of the imprinting centers having an abnormality, there might be something else going on. So they've done these studies where they've gone and said, well, are any of the other imprinting centers messed up? And the answer is, is yes, in about 10% of them, you're having other imprinting areas, other methylation centers that are disrupted. Do those represent a distinct, different etiology? Do those actually represent some of the somatic changes that are leading to the cancer, like you're hypothesizing? I think the data is still out on that. We, there are some genetic defects that are inherited that cause the multiple loci disorders, but whether or not those fully uh, always show Russell Silver, always show beckwith and the answer is it does both. So, so it might just lead to a more instability causing variability rather than a specific cause-effect correlation. And with that, with the lights, I think we got to be done. So thank you all for your time.